Hey all, welcome to another chat with uh, experts in both research and practice in the experience of digital teaching and learning. I have an opportunity now to chat with a longtime friend and collaborator in the digital learning space, uh, Dave Cormier. Uh, I've known him for many years when he first erroneously had philosophical views about the nature of objectivity, and he has shown himself to be demonstrably wrong on numerous occasions since. However, in spite of that, Dave's an awesome person who's got fantastic expertise in uh, just the whole spectrum of digital learning from the teaching and learning stage right through to the administrative aspects of it. He was involved early on in what's now termed, actually I think coined the term MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. And so Dave, real pleasure to be able to spend a few moments with you. How are you doing? Uh, thanks, George. That was almost a nice introduction. Um, I'm doing great. It's certainly been an exciting week. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, I just started a new job in January where I'm more deeply involved in digital online learning now. I was doing more administrative work before. And uh, as terrible as all this and difficult as all this stuff is, I got to say, it's a pretty exciting time to be an online learner. Yeah, I mean, I mean and that's, that's a part that is, uh, you know, really uh, fantastic in some ways. I mean, on some ways, it's clearly horrible and upsetting and disruptive. Yeah, for sure. Students are, you know, critically impacted, faculty are impacted, you know, collectively significant mental health influences as Absolutely. well. On the flip side of that, or not even the flip side, just recognizing that is the backdrop. Yeah. But there are people such as yourself that have lived and breathed in networks and in digital environments for probably two decades already. Yeah. And the expertise that you've acquired and the experiences that you've had really solidly conclude you can succeed in this environment, your students can succeed in your environment, and you can have comparable or in many cases better learning experiences than you and your students might have had in the classroom. You certainly can. Um, I think you know, it, it's, it's such a weird time to apply that experience to this current situation. I've got enough of a gray beard now, I can call myself experienced. Um, but a lot of what we're doing right now is not really fantastic pedagogy, right? So a lot of what we're doing now is desperate pedagogy, um, or mostly administrative pedagogy, you know, never has Blackboard been so well termed a learning management system than, uh, than this week, because that's certainly a lot of what we've been doing. Um, but it has given the opportunity to give people some advice that maybe is not as clearly meant as, as the way that I say it. So one of the things that I've been saying to a lot of people, for instance, is if you're going to go and do a live facilitation, and if you're a business prof, I'm saying, hey, uh, this is a really great way to, you know, prepare your students for the real world because they're going to be in live collaborative things in their own work. And if they leave their microphone on, they could lose a contract. And the business profs are getting excited about going online and preparing their students. And I've been talking to the people from social work about pedagogies of care and how you can use that time to check in with your students. They're having difficult times at home and you know their lives have changed. This is a chance for you to connect with them in ways that you really couldn't do face to face. And uh, those things are all true, but they're also about getting people to think about how they teach generally. Because for me, I mean, you said it, comparable or better experiences, for me, online learning has never been about trying to do a different thing. It's been about trying to find a better way to teach and a better way to learn. And when information comes in abundantly, maybe not knowledge, but certainly information comes in abundantly, uh, rather than the scarce way we used to get it, that changes what it means to learn and we need to adapt. And for me, online learning has about, been about learning to adapt to that space and uh, learning about the ways that our own classrooms have, face-to-face -face classrooms have strengths and deficiencies. You know, face-to-face -face classrooms really, really favor the extrovert, right? The person who can explode into a conversation, the person who has the witty repartee on the tip of their tongue, not always the smartest person in the room, I am full proof of that, um, but often, online in a discussion forum for instance where somebody has five minutes to reflect before they say something you get a deeper richer conversation it's just it's the way it turns out so i think it's a really interesting opportunity right now to sort of introduce some people who we would have never seen in this conversation smart people who love their classroom and love to teach sometimes um but people who always thought that the online learning that they saw from major american organizations who will not be named was what online learning had to be that it had to be rote, that it had to be mastery learning, that it had to be lockstep, that it had to be multiple choice. 
um, that's what people have seen. And we're getting a chance right now to show them that that's not all that it has to be, which is cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I had a, yesterday, I had an interview with the uh, illustrious uh, Professor Bonnie Stewart. And one of the points that uh, she raised in her discussion was that, you know, that we're shifting to networks. I mean, that's part of it. There's a, there's a power rebalancing that happens in digital environments. What would you say to teachers that are getting in this environment now and suddenly everything's disoriented, your power structure's changed, uh, people are uh, as ready to learn and connect with one another, they can easily get a hold of information online. You can't control the narrative the way you might be able to mm -hmm. when you design and teach a course in classroom or online. It's, it's much more network and distribute. What kind of advice would you give? Um, I think it would be to sort of examine your first principles. One of the things I always tell people um, is to think about what you do in the first two minutes of your classroom in a face-to-face -face classroom, think about those things that you do and analyze the ways in which you do engage and allow people to interact with you. And take that more social approach to learning that you may have outside of your formal lecture and amp that part up a little bit. You know, the way that you may talk to a student inside your office rather than in the, like, while you're in the formal lecture. So in a lot of us, we have those other literacies to interact with students. We just don't think of them as classroom literacies. So for some people, that's what I try to get them to do is explore that more professional engagement you might have with a grad student who's working on a research project, um, who you're, you should be training and sort of bringing into the field and giving a sense of what it is to be a professional, your teaching can be like that, right? Your teaching can be that same kind of mentorship that you have with a grad student, uh, with a postdoc, with that student who comes to your office for advice. Um, and, and I think it's about sort of sharpening those skills and thinking of them as classroom skills too. So the, the other end that you bring to the conversation uh, is now, I mean, because you've run this, the gamut of, uh, you know, back in early 2000, you were running podcasts online, uh, yep. I think it was EdTech Talk or something yep. like that. I can't remember the name. EdTech Talk is still running. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's probably 20 years now that, uh, that that's been a thing and you've been active in blogging and writing. So you've been in both a... Uh, a teacher and an explorer of the online medium. And over the last few years, you've become more and more involved in the administrator aspect of it and the building capabilities as an institution, building capabilities yeah. as when you were with PEI, really almost at a provincial level and so on. Yeah. So what, what kind of uh, guidance could you provide to those administrators that are now in a position like yours where you need to support the onlining of a huge percentage of your existing curriculum. It's interesting. Um, what I'm telling people right now is to not think about this for the next three weeks, but to plan like this for summer. Um, there's a really, really, really good chance that nobody's going to be teaching a course this summer face to face. Um, the way the numbers are working out, you look at the stuff that's come out of the UK a couple days ago. I don't think we're going back to school this summer. Um, I think in the next three weeks, you're not going to be able to develop great pedagogy in two and a half weeks, right in time for exams and whatever. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think I really like what my school did um, about uh, this term, which is they got into Senate, they suspended the Senate regulations, and they told people to be nice to their students. Um, and I, I think that's all you're going to do in the short term. Try to make it from a, from a digital learning strategy perspective, which is my current title, um, I think try to make the transition as smooth as you can for faculty so they don't hate the internet when we come out of this. Um, but that's really all you can get done now. You know, be nice to students, try not to make it terrible. Um, but for the summer, we, we have some time. We've got a month and a half, we've got two months. And I think um, my advice would be twofold. One of them is to not think of this as a technical problem because in 2020, teaching on the internet is not a technical problem. I've not seen anybody who has any facility, like who has an email account or has a Facebook account or has any, has any digital capacity who can't, given two hours of application, figure out how to use most internet systems. You can, you just have to care. And that's the piece. This is not a technical problem, it's a caring problem, right? So you need to put people in a position where their digital learning is rewarded on the tenure track. You need to put them in a position where their digital warning uh, is rewarded by a uh, pat on the back by the deans, by recognition in one way or another, uh, where they get seen and this gets seen as something that is 
good for the cause. Like that really has to be something you put in. You need to know why it's important to do this. It can't just be, everybody's willing to, to pull together now for the next four weeks. I'm, I'm using the Canadian timelines, obviously, but you know, exams for us are gonna be about the middle of April. Everybody's gonna be able to pull together for that. The next one is not gonna be leading the charge to pull stuff together. Gotta to have a reason to get there. So I think that purpose is key. Um, also, I think trying to um, free up as many people as you can to get out and work inside the departments is the other piece. So you may need to take, uh, you were talking about the illustrious Bonnie Stewart yesterday who works in a faculty of education. Um, she is a professor of online and workforce learning. Um, clear her slate, take her courses away and get her out there helping people transition, right? Take those key people who are already there inside the department, who have the respect to people, who people know, who have experience and clean their slates, get the bodies out there so you can support people. Those are the two things that come to the top of my mind right away. So I've been, I'm working on this very issue right now. And I think um, those will make a huge, huge difference. Uh, uh, great points, because administrators face a twofold challenge. On the one hand, you're absolutely right. It's, you know, you have a patient that is now at your doorstep that needs a series of uh, urgent treatments, if you will, uh, but you also need long-term care. And yeah. I think the reality is, getting, first of all, we've been moving towards digital network technologies as a society for a long period of time. Universities have been moving in it in a slower way, but they have been. They've increased capacity. They've, they've built, in many cases, an LMS infrastructure. They've maybe developed some recording studios on campus and the list goes on. So that's happened. Yeah. What you're facing now is not normal. And it is going to be a three, six week cycle where the best you can do is the best you can do. The reality though is there's no end in sight right now. And even when we have a return to classrooms, it won't be a return to normal. We just had a session with a group of students and one of the things that came through was, you know, they're applying for graduate school, but the exams that need to be taken are literally not accessible, which means what's going to, you know, you're seeing the download pipeline of this six months down the road, we right. will have the pipeline delayed. And, and there's a lot of factors that we aren't even thinking about right now. Academic appeals. Academic appeals, I was heard, I'm not sure to what degree this was uh, official, but University of Wisconsin-Madison has just said, ah, screw it, this semester is done, we'll just burn it. And, uh, and so, so it's not that everybody's moving online, some are just literally shutting down. And this is the same holds true for schools, and you pick that up later. So we're at a point where, yes, the earth, and I keep hearing this, this is not normal, uh, you know, this, this is uh, panic, move online. This isn't what it's like. That's true. However, while that may be true now, it also reflects a broader trend of moving towards digital networks, which yeah. means that you should be thinking and building capabilities three, six, 12 months down the road, because at minimum, even if we return back to regular classroom instruction, the landscape will be changed. You will have a, an emerging skill set in your faculty population and your staff population to teach online. And they'll realize, you know what, maybe not everything works online, but a lot of stuff works. And a lot of it works better than in classrooms as yeah. well. Yeah, you, you try collecting people's assignments. Yeah, the first time they get all collected for you, and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. We were telling the professor a couple days ago, and they're like, you know, if you put it in like this, you can just click on the student's name and see all the work they did for the whole term. What? Yeah, yeah, you just kind of do this and this. But that's going to save me like, like yeah, I totally will. You know, there's all kinds of stuff like that. The other thing that, the, to that point about how things are changing and the difference between face-to-face -face and the, the regular world and higher academic, um, higher education. Wow, it's been a long week already. Um, if you try to sell an encyclopedia secondhand right now, uh, you're not going to get any takers because that knowledge access in the world just isn't a thing anymore. It's not something that everybody understands that it's way faster to use the internet than it is to look through an encyclopedia to get information. However, secondhand textbook sales are still soaring. We still have this sort of total attachment to the idea of structured content, linear content of mastery based content um, inside the school system in a way that, in, and especially in a school system that claims that it's moving towards job preparedness. I don't believe it should, but if it is, then the idea of that linear process is ridiculous. Um, because there's no, um, there's no workforce now that's, that works that way anymore. 
you know, um, there are only so many factory jobs and most of them require computer knowledge. Yeah, and uh, interesting outputs with that as well is the, the there there is a broader systemic argument to be made for a different way of doing curriculum, a an approach to curriculum that emphasizes uh, co-creation and social creation the way that say a group of programmers write software. Uh, yeah. You do it together. You do it globally. You do it by pulling an awful lot of code online, and the list goes you, on. You and, steal first. And then you do it together. Like it's that, that whole part of I'm going to adopt this thing and I'm going to manipulate it and then I'm going to change it. Yeah. Nobody does anything from scratch anymore. I, mean, you, I, I designed a K-12 grade 11 uh, computer science curriculum a couple years ago. And when I was working for the PI government and it took me probably three months to convince everybody that we needed to teach kids to steal code ethically because there are no coders who don't steal code. What we want people to do is not stop doing that because that's how it's done in the field. We want them to do it ethically. We want them to cite people. We want them to, you know, steal code they're allowed to steal. Um, but that transition for people is a very difficult one because they think of their classrooms as the start rather than, you know, you've got 25 or 150 people come in your classroom with all different experiences and all kinds of different starts. So one of the things that, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm, you know, reasonably aligned with, with your thinking in, you know, in this regard and the value of, of, uh, you know, sort of community approaches, the value of network structures to supporting yeah. development and the list goes on. One of the difficulties though, and I had a chat with Justin Reich from MIT and I know you're mm -hmm. familiar with him as well. And yeah. He made a really good point when we were chatting, which is there is a penalty to moving online. And that penalty is actually borne quite often by the most vulnerable population. It's people from lower socioeconomic status, people that are underrepresented in the university system. So the penalty then of moving online has a cost. There's a secondary cost, which is a pedagogical change, which carries yet an additional penalty. So how would you respond to that? Uh, that's an interesting one. So. I'm not, there, there's certainly a pedagogical delay as people transition to those ways of doing it. Though for me, I don't buy the new pedagogy argument. I mean, this is just Dewey. Like we're not making huge leaps in of pedagogical newness here. Like the idea of collaboratively building knowledge is you, know, you can call it Socratic, right? So this is the humanist track down the middle of higher education it starts about 1350. And then what we've got are the, the other track coming down, right? The scholastics who believe that everything is lined up and you're just learning the, the basis. So I think the first thing I would say is that this is the same pedagogical argument we've been having for hundreds year, for a hundred years. Um, yes, transitioning from one to the other is difficult, but it's not new, would be my first, my response to the second piece. To the first one, I mean, outside of, you know, the, that beautiful speech that was made by, um, the founder of the Open University in 1969, I forget his name now, but when he was talking about widening participation and overtly trying to create openness of space, openness of method, openness of, um, of access for people, where they were consciously trying to create ways for people to come into higher education who didn't have access before. Most of higher ed excludes people anyway. Um, you know, it excludes people by what kind of language we reward, by the ways in which people argue, by the, the sort of the difference between oralities. Um, so I would say that the technology and the switch online exposes the ways in which our um, marginalized people in our society are not privileged inside of higher ed. I don't think it creates it. Um, and if it exposes it, we can find it and fix it. I think that's awesome, but I don't think it creates it. So Is that too long an answer? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, I think we're all trying to collectively make sense of the landscape that's in front of us and yeah. different people have different views and different opinions on what uh, the nature of that is. And I think it's, it, and I've been arguing with, with a group of colleagues lately that the thing that we most need in learning research is a theory of context because uh, we, we, 
this factor occurs this way, or these combinations of factors combine for these output, outputs in this kind of a context. So when somebody says teaching online doesn't work or lectures online don't work, well, actually they do. They work very well. A very talented lecturer who is passionate about her topic, she can lecture brilliantly well and have students captivated and engaged on yeah. But then someone could say, well, active learning is much better. And I'm like, well, you know, it depends again. Like, what's the subject area? How engaged is a faculty member in that conversation? How do they redirect when there's misunderstandings that arise and the list goes on? So I'm trying to get at is we need a theory of context for what works in education because there is nothing writ large that's pre-assumed outside of context. So you could say, yes, power structures matter in education, which they do. However, mm -hmm. in some cases, Strong guidance from a faculty member early on in a learning experience can be tremendously valuable for setting a student for longer term success. It doesn't mean that strong faculty presence is the only way to go. And in the same regard, you might say that, you know, community as a curriculum model, the work that you've pioneered for, for many years, uh, is, is a terrific way to get students engaged and involved in knowledge creation that sort of mimics what happens in the quote unquote real world out there. Yeah. And it's absolutely true. There are settings such as community as curriculum uh, crisis situations where that often doesn't work and suddenly yeah. experts are critical. Like right now, I don't want community as curriculum telling me how to do COVID. I want medical Ooh. doctors who have exceptional expertise and epidemiologists telling me what to do. That's what I'm trying to emphasize that and, and actually, let's take that, that example. Bill. Let's take that example and split it up. With a COVID situation, I don't want anybody but experts dealing with the complicated end of this process. The things that are about science, that are about identifiable things that people have researched and come up with answers for. I'm totally fine with that. I am not as comfortable with them telling us how to stay sane while we're doing it. That that piece of complexity that it's about the human experience and how we all are going to be impacted by the fact that we're not leaving our houses and spending way more time with people we ostensibly care about. Um, that piece is something we're all going to have to negotiate together. That's going to be something that's going to have to evolve out of us talking to each other like this, mm -hmm. out of us, me talking with my kids. I, if I dictate how we work in this house, that's not going to work. And I mean, it's just, I, I you totally agree. Strong, you introduced me to man, me. Dave, it would work. You introduced me to Dave Snowden um, 10 years ago. Yeah. And that distinction between complexity and the complicated and how those contexts are totally different. If you take something simple like washing your hands, mm -hmm. I don't want an exploratory version of that. I don't want to have a discussion about it. I don't want to uh, feel about it. I don't want to do any of those things. I just want people to wash their damn hands. Like yeah. really just wash them. Um, and in those cases, those simple cases in that category of the, the Dave Snowden's Kinevin model, I'm perfectly comfortable with top down dictatorships. Yeah. When it comes to the complexity of the human experience, I don't feel the same way about it. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and, and actually even still, even still, I don't think of them as, as monoliths either. So if you look at the curriculum, community as curriculum model, I very strongly believe in the interference by the faculty member in the learning process as early as possible. I just don't grade it. Um, and to me, my job as a leader inside of those environments is to try to get people to learn, but not necessarily what I want them to learn. Yeah. Right? And that's, again, it's complex, right? And it depends on what we're talking about. So I guess I agree with you, George. That's, it was hard to say. It just took me a long time to say, I agree with you, George. That's, you know, I, I think we should end on that note. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> But well, we actually, we've been trying to keep these videos short, but it's, it's rare that we have a short conversation. But uh, so I think I will actually, on a serious note, end the discussion here. But thanks for, for your insight. And I will certainly share resources of your work and so on with uh, others uh, taking the course and to track some of the work that you're doing online right now in terms of webinars sure. and getting people up to speed on this topic as well. So I sure. appreciate you taking the time on short notes. Good. So, My pleasure. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Yeah, I'll try not to. All right. Take care. <laughs>